I would like to talk about the second stage of the business judgment rule in Israel. Uh, the business, business judgment rule has made its way to Israeli case law gradually. In the beginning, in several decisions of district courts, several obitur dictums of the Supreme Court hinting that the Supreme Court is paving the way for the rule, and finally in the solemn de declaration uh, of Justice Samit in the famous Vodinikov case, uh, mentioning that uh, the, finally the business judgment rule, or at least its Israeli version, has finished its journey from Delaware to the Mediterranean coast and is now officially a part of Israeli case law. So the Vodinikov decision has in one way reduced the uncertainty regarding the legal situation. However, as we know, in the legal profession, and that's what's very nice about it, uh, there is always room for uncertainty. And usually, each seemingly, seemingly definitive answer raises an endless amount of new questions. And this has also happened regarding the business judgment rule. And what I would like to really briefly discuss uh, today are some of these questions, some of these open questions that uh, still have to be decided by uh, Israeli courts. So one of the questions is whether the business judgment rule is relevant only regarding the company's claims against its directors. Justice Groskopf has expressed his opinion that only in such claims, the claims of the shareholders against the directors or of the company against the directors, and not in third parties' claims, the rationale of the rule is relevant. To his opinion, which he may be able to explain better than I do, the implied understanding that justifies you will correct me, I'm sure. The implied understanding under, uh, under that rule uh, is that the shareholders would rather agree to waive the right to sue the directors in order to ensure that the directors will make the right business decisions, including adventurous and unconventional decisions. However, this implied agreement of the shareholders is not relevant where other third parties are concerned. Regarding such third parties, such as the suppliers of the company, its creditors, its employees, this presumption is, re is irrelevant, and therefore the rule is, that is based on this presumption should not apply to them. I would like to point out another way to address this question. One of the motivations in applying the business judgment rule is undoubtedly the intention to allow directors to make unconventional, risky decisions without being afraid that a judge will retroactively examine the reasonableness of these decisions with the famous hindsight bias. However, if the directors will fear possible claims from third parties, it may make the rule ineffective and may cause the same chilling effect of the rule that the rule is intended to address. In other words, <clears throat> as far as the directors are concerned, it may, it may not be relevant whether the claim according to which they are responsible to the company's failure is a claim filed by the shareholders of the company for ex or, for example, by its employees. Either claim may prevent them from being innovative and original and may motivate them to prefer the conservative way of thinking that is easier to defend retroactively. If this is the case, the conclusion may be that the distinction between shareholders' claims and third parties' claims may be irrelevant. Furthermore, the motivation for the business judgment rule may be, more gen may be a more general one, a presumption according to which uh, directors may make innovative decisions will benefit the society as a whole and not only the company. Whereas if the directors will usually make conservative decision, it will adversely affect the progress of the market. What is then the relevant distinction between decisions that are protected by the business judgment rule and decisions that are not? I would like to suggest that only decisions that can be viewed as business decisions are protected and uh, that these decisions are protected dis disregarding the identity of the plaintiffs, shareholders or a third party. Decisions that are not business decisions are never protected by the business judgment rule. An example to uh, such a decision is a decision regarding the company's disclosure requirements. In claims alleging that the directors breached their disclosure duties and caused damages, defendants often claim that they are protected by the business judgment rule. Uh, I think Justice Groskopf and myself agree that uh, these cla in such claims, the business judgment rule may be irrelevant, but I think <coughs> our explanations to this uh, result are different. 
So one way to address such a defense as irrelevant is by saying that it is not a claim on behalf of the company or its shareholders at the time of the disclosure, but a claim of a third party. But it can also be argued that such a claim has nothing to do with business decisions, and this is why it cannot be protected by the business judgment rule. The decision regarding the question what the company should or should not disclose in a certain set of circumstances is a legal decision and not a business one. There is only one right legal answer to the question uh, of what and when should be disclosed. And that answer is stated by the court that interprets the legal requirements and implies them to the relevant sets of fact. <clears throat> if the court finds that the directors did not dis disclose the fact that the law required them to disclose, applying the business judgment rule would not help the directors. It is not a business decision, and being a wrong decision, the directors may be held responsible for the damages caused by it. Another question is the relationship between the business judgment rule and its application on exculpatory provisions in the company's bylaws. Are these defenses identical? I've addressed this question in the ATIA decision, and my opinion is that there is a difference between the application of the business judgment rule as a defense and the application of an exculpatory provision where such a provision exists. As we all know, in order to be protected by the business judgment rule, the directors have to prove not only that they made their decision in good faith and with no conflict of interest, but also that the decision was an informed one. And some decisions of Israeli courts, including the Verdinikov decision, tried to define what should or should not be considered as an informed decision. Justice Gottswurf discussed it in uh, re reference to the question of the procedure of the decision making. A decision that was not made in the procedural way outlined by the court will not be protected by the rule. To my opinion, the protection of the exculpatory provision is a wider protection where there is a valid provision according to which the directors cannot be held responsible for negligent decision, this provision will apply even if the director's decision was not an informed one, and the only situation where such a provision will not apply is where the court finds that the decision was not a negligent one, but rather a decision in which the directors breached their duty of loyalty. There are many other open questions one of which would be whether the business judgment rule can apply in cases claiming the directors did not make a decision, as opposed to claims regarding a, deci a decision that was made. Theoretically, the rule applies only regarding decisions that were made and cannot protect directors that refrain from making a decision. A decision not made cannot be claimed to be a valid business decision. But is it always so? And what then is the standard of review regarding decisions not made? Another inter interesting question is the question of whether bi business judgment rule applies only to directors or to other officers of the company. Uh, would uh, an uh, advisor, uh, a legal advisor of the company that helped the company reach a business decision would be protected by the rule? Would there be a difference between a legal advisor that is an employee of the company and a legal advisor that is an outside advisor regarding the uh, standard of review of the courts. So as you can see, there are many open questions. There will be new topics to discuss next year in the 14th birthday of this conference. And thank you very much. <laughs>